we're going to have this afternoon a presentation of four of the articles that will appear in um, volume 10 of the annual reviews. Uh, before we go there, I will ask uh, Richard Gallagher, who's the president of annual reviews, to please say a few words um, uh, about, uh, about the journal. Richard will just take a couple minutes, and then we'll proceed with the first presentation. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming to this meeting. It's a bit of a coming out party for annual reviews. It's the first time we've actually held a, a meeting of this size, and we're uh, delighted that it's been um, so well attended. Not surprising, given the incredible lineup of people and the huge amount of work that the editorial uh, committee, led by um, Andrew and Bob, have, have, have done for us. I'd also like to acknowledge the um, very prestigious group of partners. Um, we have total trust in them, and uh, we're, we're very happy to, to be working with them. I do want to just spend a couple of minutes at risk of repeating um, what um, Andrew uh, said so eloquently this morning. This is uh, the um, mission of Annual Reviews. We're a nonprofit publisher dedicated to synthesizing and integrating knowledge for the progress of science and the benefit of society. Um, how do we do that? We do it by publishing reviews, and there are really four parts to a review, um, all of which will have attitude. Uh, I, the first thing is that we want the review to capture current understanding of a topic, including what's very well supported and what's still quite controversial. We want to set that work in historical context, highlight the major questions that remain to be addressed, and the likely course of research in upcoming years, and importantly, outline the practical applications and general um, significance of the research to society as a whole. And I think if you look through the um, current volume and the collection of articles from previous uh, volumes of um, annual review of financial economics, you'll see that it does just, just those, those things. You can access annual review's content simply by going on our site. We've got a Google search type interface where you type in what topic you're interested in knowing more about, and it'll give you a list of articles that, um, that, that you might like to read. Um, there are 51 annual review's titles altogether. These, these are just a selection of them. They're in uh, biomedical science, cancer biology is there, clinical psychology. Um, social sciences, criminology, economics, um, the physical sciences, condensed matter physics, computer science, and so on. There's really, it's a treasure trove of, of very powerful um, information on all subjects uh, in, the, in the sciences. Um, we actually have three titles in economics. The parent journal is the annual review of economics. Uh, financial economics, which um, we're celebrating today, and we have uh, uh, the annual review of resource uh, economics as well, um, amongst the 51 titles that, uh, that we produce. Just to say a word about what we're trying to do in the future, annual reviews has been considered to be a great resource for the academic community. Um, my background is in immunology, and the annual review of immunology really is the, the Bible of, of, of immunologists. Uh, but we realize that the content that we have is of interest well beyond the uh, academic community. And we want to outreach and, and bring this uh, treasure trove of information to new audiences. One of the ways that we're doing this is through uh, a journalist contributed um, uh, magazine called Knowable. Um, Knowable magazine takes annual reviews articles and it gives them, it, it tells a story around those around those articles um, written by experienced journalists. The last time I gave a talk, this was the homepage, the top 10 secrets about stress and health. Um, on there as well, there's an article about uh, how insects sleep and one about fighting urban violence. So there's really, it's really a wide range of, um, a wide range of topics. The homepage today has got a number of articles on uh, financial economics. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's know, knowablemag.org, and um, it's fully and freely available to everyone. Not only that, if you work for a publication and you want to republish the stuff on Knowable, 
it's fully and freely available for you to republish it. <clears throat> the only other thing I'd like to say is that, um, as, as Andrew said earlier, Financial Economics uh, Journal is fully and freely open to everyone to read through the rest of the year. Our goal is to make all of annual reviews, all 51 titles, fully available for everyone to read. We want it to be, to move from an academic resource to a public benefit. Um, if there's anyone in the room that would be interested in working with us on making that a possibility, I'd be delighted to speak to you and tell you what, what our plans are. But in the meantime, I hope you'll look at the financial economics articles and um, enjoy them and give us your feedback on them. Um, thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the meeting. And the first paper will be by Franklin Allen from Imperial College. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. The annual review of financial economics is a great uh, institution. I'm going to talk about uh, architecture and stability of the financial system. And this is a joint paper with my colleague, Ansgar Walter, who's going to give the second part of the presentation. Now, financial architecture comes in many different forms. And if we look back historically, we can see some of the, the, the breadth of that. So if you think about the 19th century, for example, the exchange rate system was extremely important in terms of financial stability. So, over time, many countries adopted the gold standard, and that had a, a system whereby the notion was that if you came under pressure, if your economy was doing badly and gold started to flow out, you could go off the gold standard. But the idea was that at some point you would rejoin at the same parity as you, you left. And that helped stability because people realized if they just kept their money there, it would be okay. But there were a lot of currency crises, there were a lot of sovereign debt defaults, and they were the, the, a, a major type of uh, financial instability. Another important relationship was a uh, relationship between banking crises and stock market crashes. And that was particularly true in the US because of the way that the call loan market worked. So uh, banks lent to New York City banks who lent to brokers who were uh, investing on margin. And they, they were call loans, so if some liquidity shock hit and the banks needed liquidity, they could call those loans. But then that meant that people sold the shares and there was tended to be stock market crashes associated with that. Now, I think both of those uh, aspects, one and two, are more of a historical interest than, than today. Uh, but they do illustrate that the details of the institutions matter a great deal. And that's going to be one of the themes that we'll talk about. And I think one of the big problems is to try and understand what are the likely weaknesses that we face going forward in the financial system. Now, the form of the banking system is, is very important. Now, the, the, the classic um, banking literature, the diamond Dibvig model, it was basically uh, a model of single banks. And, but even there, uh, there, there were soon people pointing out that it mattered whether or not people had access to uh, financial markets. So the, the basic idea in, in Diamond and Dibbig is that it's a form of liquidity insurance that banks provide, and that that's what they do well, and then you get these two equilibria, uh, the run equilibria and the good equilibria. And what you want to do is to have something like deposit insurance to rule out um, the bad equilibria. But what Cohn and Jacqueline pointed out was that you need the depositors not to have access to financial markets because otherwise the liquidity insurance wouldn't be provided by the banks. Now, over time, subsequent papers started to talk about other architecture aspects, such as in information and liquidity structures. And Gary, who's going to speak next, has um, some papers on that. And, and many other ones uh, develop those kinds of structure. 
I think, though, that the area where we've seen a lot of um, architecture kinds of contribution is in terms of contagion of banking crises. And one of the main ideas there is the difference between complete networks and incomplete networks. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, what you can see is a, an example of four banks, and they have a complete network of interbank deposits. So each bank deposits in each other bank. And the notion there is that if there's a shock to one of the banks, then that shock can be easily absorbed because they're all interconnected, and so it, it, none of them is going to fail unless the shock's a really big one. Now, the one on the right, right, the incomplete network structure, doesn't have that. It has that you deposit in one bank, which deposits in another bank, and so on, round the circle. And what you get there is it's not very resilient, because if one bank goes down, then that's going to have a big effect on the other bank, and then on the next bank, and so on. And so in those kinds of structures, you can have even small shocks at very... Um, uh, relatively unimportant banks have huge impact on the financial system. So it's an example where you get financial fragility where small shocks have big effects. Now these were very simple examples as an, a number of other papers that followed up. Um, particularly nice one is um, by Darren Asimoglu and co-authors. And what they do is, is have a more general model which shows that networks can have... Um, for small losses, be okay. That's the, the ring network. But for large ones, they're not. And they also point out this Im important idea that it's sometimes good not to have full connections. If you have separated systems, if you get a, a shock that brings down the system, if they're separated, one survives and the other doesn't. And that's an interesting idea, because we think normally of globalization as being this wonderful thing that improves everything. But in fact, this, these kinds of network results show that that may not be the case. In fact, you might be better off to have separate systems uh, from that. There's a quite a ba big uh, empirical literature on this. And this is um, uh, one of the most recent papers. It's an ECB paper. And what it does is to use uh, the data from the supervisory part of the ECB. And what you can see, I'll go through this very quickly, is the EA is the Eurozone area. That's all the banks in the Eurozone. And then the outer circle is the international banks that they're linked with. And what it's representing is how, how these links work in reality in the Eurozone area and how they have links to the rest of the global financial system. Now, if you look at the bottom, you see the colors. So the red, for example, on the inner circle in the Eurozone area is Germany, and on the outer, it's China. And so if you have a, a link from a, a red inner dot to a, a red outer dot, that's a, a flow from uh, China to Germany or vice versa. Now, it's an interesting paper because what they do is to show that there are tipping points. So for small shocks, everything's fine, but given this actual representation of these interbank architecture, you get situations where you can get a lot of instability, which changes quite quickly depending on the nature of the architecture and the, uh, the banks that, that make it up. So with that, let me turn over to Ansgar to talk about the other interesting area, which is non-bank banks. Thank you, Franklin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about um, intermediaries that are not banks and their stability, in particular asset managers who have had a very good 10 years. If you look at this chart, which is the global scale of asset management compiled by the BIS, it's more than doubled since the crisis and now stands at around $42 trillion of total assets, which is about half of the global banking system. So this trend has sparked a lot of new thinking as to whether it's um, good or bad for financial stability as a whole. And 
that's what we'll review in this part of the paper. In particular, we're going to focus on intermediaries that are not banks, but that still issue demandable claims that investors can withdraw at any moment in time. And um, money market funds and open-end mutual funds are prime examples of, of structures like that. To organize the thinking, we're going to do it in a canonical model that looks like Diamond and Divvig, uh, but which we can also use to think about these other intermediaries. So the model is um, one that many of you will know. It date zero, there are three dates. At the first date, intermediaries can invest money for a potential return of R at um, a future date, which is in the long run, date two. And if you want to liquidate your investment in the short run at date one, then you usually have to take a hit. So you, the price that you get if you liquidate it early is going to be some number P, which depends on another number S. That's the total amount of assets being sold into the market at that point, and it's typically less than the return that you would get if you would wait. And um, also in the model are consumers who invest in these intermediaries and who may end up being liquidity shocks, so they have to consume their money in the medium run, whereas others get to wait and consume in the long run. That's a, the standard framework. But the way we've set up the investment technology allows for both sort of technological illiquidity, as in Diamond and Divvik, or market-based illiquidity, as in more recent work that focuses on, on fire sales. So a lot of the classical insights go through here. So you can have an intermediary implement the efficient trade-off between liquidity insurance and asset returns. Uh, by just issuing demandable claims that people can withdraw whenever they want. And this works well, as we know, uh, if everybody behaves as expected, if people that don't get a liquidity shock don't run on the bank. And the big stability question is, do deviations from this behavior uh, have the ability to generate runs on the intermediary? Do they, can runs become self-fulfilling in another equilibrium? And um, if you're going beyond banks, then the point we want to make is that architecture starts to matter a lot. So what do we mean by architecture? We're going to adopt a very simple working definition, which is just the contract that specifies the value of the claim if you withdraw early and some other mass n of people are withdrawing early as well. So that's C1 as a function of n, the early consumption. And C2, which is the value of the claim that you get if you don't run on the bank and you wait until um, the assets mature. So this notion of architecture varies quite a lot across different business models. So you can have uh, funds, banks, even within banks, there's debate as to whether you should suspend convertibility, et cetera. And we study the stability properties of some of the architectures that you see in the real world. But our impression when writing this review was that this particular notion of architecture has not been studied as much uh, outside of the banking space. So one way to set this up would be the sort of ideal floating net asset value fund, which no matter how many people withdraw, you just liquidate just enough assets to cover the outflows. And then you accur accurately revalue all of your assets before you honor the redemptions at the end of the trading day. Right? That's a benchmark for mutual funds in the real world, and it's also, as it turns out, a, a benchmark for, for the theory of stability. So if you want to think about stability, one, one natural notion is to say, when is this intermediary uh, run proof? So when is it the case that no matter how many other people are withdrawing their money, if you're a late consumer, you're willing to wait? And it turns out, uh, a little result that you can prove is that an architecture will be run-proof if and only if the demandable claim that it offers as a function of N is bounded above by the demandable claim of a floating NAV fund. So that's interesting. I mean, the if part of the proposition is good news for the floating NAV model. It means it's, it's run-proof. The only if part means that this model is also a benchmark against which you can compare all other possible architectures, and that turns out to be quite useful. So floating nav seems like a good idea. It's also a knife edge case, because it's right on the boundary between run-proof intermediaries and, and non-run-proof intermediaries. So you can think of several ways in which you can deviate from it. Even small deviations can lead to situations where you have runs on a mutual fund, which have been explored in these papers by, by Ite and co-authors and also by, by Yao Zhang. So one example is where investors don't think that the assets are going to be revalued according to floating NAV, and 
even if they think that fixed nav is going to happen with probability epsilon, you can get runs back. Also, it could be that investors believe that early liquidations put some sort of strain on the fund so that the asset values at day two will no longer be R, but they'll be R minus epsilon times the amount that's been liquidated early. Right? So if that's the case, you can also get runs back because, again, withdrawing early becomes a good idea. So uh, the details really matter here, right? So there's other work that shows that details like the cash management policy that the fund operates determine which side of the knife edge you're on, and that can be very important. Um, so I think the really big empirical question then is how, how bad is that problem potentially in the real world? How much of the 40 trillion is at risk if mutual fund runs are a possibility in theory? Some of the flow patterns are definitely consistent uh, with, with runs in a global game. So if you look at the chart on the left of this slide, the usual relationship between performance and flows tends to be convex. So funds get rewarded by inflows for good performance. For bad performance, there's not much action. But ETA and co-authors have shown that if you look at illiquid funds that face, well, illiquidity in their primary asset market, uh, the negative flows are also related to negative performance, which is suggestive of a model of runs. And this illiquidity also tends to be quite widespread, as we've seen in other empirical work. So other than that, obviously, fixed NAV business models have had various problems during the financial crisis, and there's a large empirical literature on that as well. So um, there's been a bunch of topics that I haven't been able to touch on, and they're on this slide, including, including fintech and including things like asset pricing, uh, stock market runs, um, asymmetric information, and, and competition, banking industry concentration. But just to wrap up our talk, um, the main takeaway is that we think that architecture is very important. We've highlighted two things that are not just of historical interest, um, but going on today, one of them is networks and the other is non-bank intermediaries, where there is still, I think, a lot of research to be done to understand exactly how architecture maps into stability. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for a great presentation. and. Um, while they're taking pictures, also for keeping us on time uh, for and setting up a great example for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Gary Gordon from Yale. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the organizers for this uh, beautiful conference uh, and for asking me to say a few words. Uh, I'm going to talk about financial crises. 2007-2008 uh, reminds me of uh, Faulkner's words that the past is not only not dead, it's not past. Uh, so what is a financial crisis? Well, a financial crisis is an event in which households and firms or firms uh, no longer believe that debt, the private money of banks, is worth par and instead, to be safe, they want their cash. So it's a bank run. And banks do not have the cash, and so by this definition, they're insolvent. And just to be clear, we're talking about the system being insolvent. Right? So uh, as Bernanke said shortly after Lehman, of the 13 largest financial institutions in the United States, 12 are on the verge of bankruptcy. So it's important that we keep in mind that it's systemic. It's not any old bad thing, it's systemic. And what do we know about these things? We know that financial crises occur in all market economies, in advanced economies and emerging markets, in economies with and without central banks, in economies with and without deposit insurance. But economies can go quite a while without a, uh, without a crisis. Uh, they come on rather suddenly. They always involve private short-term debt. They're typically preceded by credit booms, but not all credit booms are bad. They occur near business cycle peaks. Uh, they're systemic, as I said. And then you have these prolonged uh, recoveries, and they're extremely, extremely costly. They look like this. Now, that's the panic of 1907. And you may say, well, I didn't see that in 2007, 2008. What do you mean there was a bank run? And the answer is, well, you weren't on a trading floor, so you didn't see it. 
And if you're like my colleagues on the trading floor, the AIG Financial Products, they saw it, they didn't know what it was. So as Einstein said, theory determines what you see, and uh, that was indeed the case. But for, the, for outsiders, uh, they indeed didn't see uh, the bank run, which is one of the most insidious things about the crisis. Because then if you only know about one crisis, you can draw a lot of lines through one crisis. Those are those narratives that Andy Lowe had up here. As soon as you have to talk about more than one crisis, um, then we have a problem. There's another problem. And the, other prob the next problem is that when a central bank is present or a, an act of government, you don't always see runs. Uh, indeed, the agents wait to see what the government's going to do. Uh, and the, if there are runs, the runs tend to come late compared to what I think of as pure crises as 2007, 2008, or the whole prior history of the US uh, from 1914 back to the 18th century. So the World Bank uh, data set, uh, there's about 150 systemic crises, uh, which follow uh, a practical uh, way of implementing uh, my definition. Uh, and these 65% uh, involve bank runs. So the issue, the issue at hand is what, what exactly is the mechanism, the mechanism of short-term debt, which can lead to the financial system being insolvent, okay? So um, let me go to that. So banks, uh, banks produce debt. That's their product. Ford produces cars. McKinsey produces advice. Banks produce uh, debt, short-term debt. And yet this debt is vulnerable to uh, runs. So it's a little paradoxical that throughout history, from the 18th century, we would observe short-term debt in various forms, and yet it all has the same problem, uh, and yet in some sense it's optimal. So why, how, how can that be? Well, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that there's a property of debt, which I'll define in a moment, called information insensitivity, which says that we're going to try to create something such that it's not profitable for any agent to produce private information about the underlying collateral, uh, and everybody knows this. And what that means is that we do not want the price system to work. So, so we're going to try to construct debt such that the price system doesn't work. I'm going to give you the intuition for that in a minute. But you know, no economists are used to thinking about price systems. The only other place where the price system is not used is inside firms, huge economies inside firms. But here's something that's going to be in the market, but we're going to try to make it so the price system doesn't work, and that's going to be optimal. So let me give you an example of that. Let's start with an example that didn't work. This is a free bank note from Bull's Head Bank, uh, pre-Civil War US. It's very worn, which means it's probably genuine because it's been passing around for quite a while. And, and here's, here's one of the issues with these kind of things. This is the haircut or discount on notes from the Bank of Tennessee in Philadelphia. Okay? So this thing's moving all over the place. What does that mean? That means if I came from New Haven to New York with a private bank note and I tried to buy lunch, they might say to me, they'd look up in this little newspaper and they'd say, wait a minute, that's not worth $10 here. That's worth $9. And I'd say, what are you talking about? I was here last week. It was worth $9.50. And there would be a big, a big problem. Contemporaries talked about this over and over again. Now, this market, this market is efficient in the FAMA sense. Right? If you, this is a, a non-interest-bearing perpetual bond uh, with an embedded put option that says you can take it back to the bank and ask for par. And what's the maturity of this note? The time it takes to get from Philadelphia to the Bank of Tennessee. And if you use that and you back out the implied volatilities and you look at that in panel data, you'll see those line up with all the risk characteristics of different states that we would expect. So it's, it's efficient in the pharma sense, but it's not economically efficient. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help to uh, uh, facilitate transactions. And this was noticed a long time ago. This is Ricardo. In the use of money, everybody is a trader. Those who are little suited to explore the mechanism of trade are obliged to make use of money, bank, bank money and are not in no way qualified to ascertain the solidity of different banks whose paper is in circulation. Accordingly, we find that laborers, mechanics, and so on suffer these severe losses. So this idea that, that we don't want this price moving around is something which is uh, of long standing. 
So what I want to do is to talk about this mechanism, and to do that, I want to give you the intuition for some work with Tree V. Dang and Bengt Holmstrom. I don't think Tree V is here. I haven't seen him. Bengt is here somewhere, or he was here. So uh, I'm just going to walk through some figures. It'll give you the intuition. It's not exactly right, uh, but it'll give you the intuition. So the idea here is uh, that when you look at this bank contract, that's the hockey stick looking thing, uh, and on the bottom there's collateral. Uh, the flat part's the face value. Um, in a moment, we're going to look at before maturity, but the idea is if the collateral value is far to the right, then there's no point in you figuring out that, that it's far to the right. You're not going to produce information and learn that it's far to the right. Now, of course, you have to have some reason to believe that it's far to the right, and we'll, we'll come to that. Suppose before uh, maturity, the collateral is distributed this way, normal. Uh, and you can see the mean there. That's the, the x-axis is the same as before. The y-axis is now the likelihood of each of those collaterals being what's going to happen at maturity. So it's most likely, most likely the mean. So now let me put those two pictures together. So here's, here's what I overlay that normal distribution on the debt contract. The x-axis is the same. It's the collateral. And the y-axis now has two scales. It's the price at the end, or the final value, or uh, the likelihood of these different collateral values. Now, the point of doing this is to point out that if you wanted to spend money to determine you know, how to think about this debt, uh, what you're going to find is the integral of that little blue triangle. Right? And the point is that's very small. It's very small. And so it may not pay you uh, to do that. And that's going to be important because what, what, a, what a crisis is going to be is this. You can think of this distribution as the entire economy. If it moves a little bit to the left, that triangle now becomes larger and it becomes red. And if that's common knowledge, then suddenly I'm worried that you're going to produce information, or you have already, or you're worried that I'm going to produce information and nobody knows what's going on, and so we all better go get our cash. So we just need, we need the macro economy to weaken a little bit. That's the, that's the distribution shifting to the left. And that triangle, if that triggers information production or fears of information production, we're going to say it went from information insensitive to sensitive. Okay? And think of that, all the short-term debt, or at least one kind of short-term debt, that's going to happen to in the economy. So just, just to make this clear, here's equity. Equity is the green line. Uh, equity... When, when, the, when the collateral value is to the right of the kink, the firm is solvent, and this stuff is, this stuff is uh, always information sensitive, right? Because if you go from the collateral up to the green line and over to the price of the equity, when it's, when it's rising like that, it's always going to be, it's always going to be sensitive. That's why you see equity traded all in one exchange in a central place, whereas other things are traded over the counter, uh, and we don't much care about the price. So, so the point here is that when you cut the information, uh, cut, the, cut the cash flows, you cut the information. And that, that's, that's the key here. Now, here's, here's the loss distribution on debt. Okay? So most of the time, uh, debt has no loss. You could lose everything. There's a maximum you can lose. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reflect this around like this, like that. And I'm going to put that together with the debt contract picture like that. So you see the reflected distribution, the loss distribution of a, of a debt. Now is the, that's now the collateral for the short-term debt, which was the original green line. And the point is that that little triangle, we've now made that triangle really, really small, right? And the, the, intu the intuition is kind of straightforward. If I, if I have long-term debt, that we think is pretty close to information insensitive, and I use that to back the short-term debt, then I, by, do, by using debt on debt, I can maximize the information insensitivity. And if I do that, then I'll have, uh, then I'll have something that we can use as money, uh, whether it's repo or fee bank notes or demand deposits or bills of exchange. But uh, it, again, it has this vulnerability being privately produced that if we have the whole economy shift a little bit to the left, which would be this distribution making the triangle bigger, then you, then you have this mechanism where everybody runs on all of that debt, all of that debt. 
That's the kind of mechanism you need for a crisis, right? Because a crisis is we go over the cliff, right? It's not, it's not uh, the case that it's, you know, you know, there's something about, I don't know, leverage or subprime or ratings or whatever you want. That doesn't tell us the mechanism. It doesn't say those are unimportant, but it doesn't tell us the mechanism. Now, this has a lot of implications. Uh, one of the implications is that banks are going to be surrounded by secrecy because they don't want people producing information about their backing collateral. In fact, in this world, uh, the optimal thing would be for the government to pass a law that says anybody who produces information about short-term debt gets shot. Right? We don't want people producing information. Um, and so banks go to great lengths to preserve this opacity, and that's why they have certain kinds of you know, consumer mortgages, small business loans, uh, and so on. Now, uh, so, so, so what happened that we got ourselves into trouble uh, in 2007, 2008? So look at this picture. Let me tell you what this picture is. This picture is the components of privately produced safe debt divided by total privately produced safe debt. This is Fed flow funds data. It's from this little paper with Metric and Llewellyn. So let me just say it again. It's the components of privately produced safe debt divided by total privately produced safe debt. Now, you can see that in 1952, the bulk of this was demand deposits. And the government had made demand deposits information insensitive by making, having deposit insurance, which, by the way, was passed over the objections of economists who were babbling on about moral hazard back then. Um, but you can see what happens to demand deposits. As a fraction of total privately produced safe debt, it goes straight down pretty much, right? It flattens out at the end. And what's the next category up? Well, the next category above debt is money market instruments. So that's repo, commercial paper, money market, uh, money market funds, especially institutional money market funds. So what's happening, in, there's a lot of things happening in the background. Um, uh, part of it is that there, there's this massive pools of cash in the hands of institutional investors because of all the wealth that's been created in the last 30 or 40 years uh, is, is one, one thing. So you need a sort of checking account for institutions, right? So that next category up is their checking account. So most commercial paper is one to three days. Uh, repos, you know, overnight or short. Uh, money market funds, it's on demand. And so what, what's going to back all that stuff? Well, the answer is the next category. So the next category is triple A securitizations. Triple A securitizations. And how do we get, make AAA securitizations? Well, the fact that demand deposits are going down doesn't mean the banks are making fewer loans. It means we're taking the loans that they make and we're putting them into bonds, and those bonds are going to back the money market instruments. So let me say a couple words about that. One, one thing is that these two systems are symbiotic. You, can, you, know, you kill one, you kill the other. The other thing I would point out is that shadow banking didn't develop in like 2003. If you look at this picture, this metamorphosis of the entire financial system has been going on for quite a while, right? At least since the mid 70s. And so you say, well, this is flow of funds data. How come the Fed didn't see this? And the answer is, you know, from Einstein, theory determines what you see. Theory determines what you see. So if you have no concept of safe debt, it's never going to occur to you to make this picture. Right? So, so this, this transformation is uh, longstanding, large, and permanent. Okay, so history, history suggests that financial crises are inevitable because the system is constantly transforming with new forms of debt, but that happens over a longer period than the attention span of financial economists, apparently. Um, so this panic showed that the system can morph but it's only this long, over this long uh, period of time. So there's tons of research questions here that we really need to work on. One, one I think is why didn't we have a crisis from 34 to 2007? If you consider somebody's narrative, you know, you say, okay, that story sounds good. Why didn't we have a crisis from 1934 to 2007? That was an exceptional period in US history. The rest of US history, we had crises every eight or 10 years. The next question is also important. What forms of bank regulation work? And what's the optimal regulation? This is not something that we study. And the reason we don't study it is because you, you need to look into the institutional and regulatory arrangements of at least two countries to figure out 
what countries have in common when they can go for 50 years or so without a crisis. So we don't, we don't really work on that. And finally, there's a question which is, is there a trade-off between financial repression and economic growth? Right? We, can, we can get rid of financial crises. It'd be like Somalia, they don't have financial crises. And so, you know, so I was recently in India for a week at the central bank. 70% of their banking system is owned by the, by the state. Right? So they don't have, they have financial crises. Lately, they've had shadow banking runs. But in general, they don't have financial crises. Then the question is, well, when you have a million people entering the labor market every month, you know, you need to have at least like 6% growth per quarter. So there, this question is really stark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. And the next presentation is by Stephen Ryan from NYU. Thank you. So I, I appreciate being asked by the financial economists running this conference to speak on accounting topics. It's very liberal and globalist of them. Um, if you'll indulge me, I want to begin with a personal anecdote. It's mostly uh, targeted to the academics in the audience. So 36 years ago, I began my scholarly, scholarly career as a doctoral student in economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. While I'm sure I benefited a lot from it, I don't remember much specific from my year and a half as an economist before I switched to accounting. But there is one thing I remember, which is uh, the faculty advisor to the students there, an associate professor, not yet famous, uh, studied the Great Depression and other financial stability related issues, told all the doctoral students that we shouldn't just be technocrats, we should try to use our knowledge to influence public policy. Um, I've remembered that ethical nudge over the course of my career. I write a fair number of accounting policy papers and I always sort of feel good about myself doing that. In the meanwhile, this associate professor became famous, the chairman of the Federal Reserve during the financial crisis, and he, along with others that were similarly minded, somehow managed to save us from another Great Depression. Um, and I, I realize we're all here for, uh, to sort of remember and think about the consequences of that uh, uh, 10 years ago. But actually, what I remember, and the reason I'm happy to speak at this conference is the nudge. <laughs> It's, you know, this conference, if it's going to do something useful, it's going to nudge future research, it's going to nudge future um, policy interactions of, of faculty. Okay. Um, so I never get to the end, so I'm going to do the bottom line now, which is bank financial reporting requirements and also the practices around those requirements affect financial stability, but in complex ways. And if you read the newspapers or listen to people speak, the effects are often misunderstood, they're overstated, they're mischaracterized. If you're going to think about the effects of accounting on banks, their decisions, on financial stability, you have to think very carefully. So I've written two, two articles for the uh, annual review, uh, one last year, one this year. Um, the editors wisely uh, put the first one in the uh, compilation because it's broader and more general. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about that one. Um, it talks about the main financial reporting issues, which are loan loss reserving, fair value accounting, and securitization accounting. Um, it talks about the channels by which financial reporting can affect stability, and there's three main ones. One is regulatory capital. Regulatory capital is based on accounting requirements, mostly. Uh, the, other, uh, the second is uh, internal discipline. So accounting requirements can require banks to develop systems or hire personnel or get information that helps them understand their risks better. And if they understand their risk better, they make better decisions. And then lastly, accounting provides information to users of financial reports, which includes investors, regulators, and others. And that can provide external discipline on banks. So I'll talk about those uh, accounting issues and the channels. And I'll also talk a little bit about the research that's uh, sort of provided evidence about those. And then if there's time, and there may not be, I'll talk about the current one, which uh, paper which is uh, talking about recent research, some of which I've done, some of which other people have done, that tries to sort of uh, refine our understanding of these uh, issues and, and channels. So first, loan loss reserving. Currently in the US, we have something called the incurred loss model, which has gotten a lot of bad press. Um, and the incurred loss model has three conditions for uh, accrual of loan losses. One is the loss has to be incurred, which means rooted in the present in some fashion. Another is it has to be probable, which is a high probability threshold for recognition. 
and the third is it has to be reasonably estimable. And people often focus on the incurred part as if it's somehow unusual, but actually it's a very typical condition in accounting. Something has, to, something has to have occurred that's rooted in the present that gives rise to accounting recognition. Maybe incurred is uh, interpreted, specified too strictly, maybe it should be weakened, but it can't be eliminated, otherwise we're not doing accounting, we're doing something else. Okay, probable, on the other hand, clearly unnecessary. We do fair value accounting now. Fair value accounting will take any probability, no matter how small and incorporated into the fair value. Probable is just a completely unnecessary condition. And then lastly, reasonably estimable. Reasonably estimable is also sort of a necessary condition. We can't put a number on something unless we can reasonably estimate it. Maybe it's interpreted too strictly like the incurred condition, but it can't be eliminated altogether. So what the FASB and the ISB internationally have done is they've come up with this notion that banks should make reasonable and supportable forecasts of the future and incorporate those forecasts into the current loan loss reserves. Okay, that's weakening the incurred condition, it's weakening the can be reasonably estimated condition. Historically, we haven't made such forecasts. Um, they get rid of the probable condition altogether. Okay. So there were allegations made during the, uh, actually they've been made periodically over time, but they were made in the crisis, that um, the problem with the incurred loss model is that banks reserve too little for loan losses in good times, and therefore they have to reserve too much for loan losses in bad times, and it's the increased reserves in bad times that drive instability, that reduce their capital at an unfortunate time, that cause them to cut back on lending, that has uh, systemically bad uh, implications. Okay. Personally, I've never found this story particularly credible because it requires banks to believe their own accounting. They've got a whole lot of information about their uh, loan performance, non-performing loans, delinquencies. Um, they've got a whole lot of information that's not accounting information. Somehow they ignore all that other information. They just focus on their accounting numbers. There's some research that uh, suggests that this these allegations are true, but probably overstated. Uh, the most famous paper in accounting is by Beatty and Liao in 2011, which, show, which measures the timeliness with which banks um, uh, estimate loan loss reserves. Timelier means uh, in good times they'll reserve more. Uh, because they reserve more in good times, they'll have to reserve less in bad times. Um, and they find that loan loss provision timeliness is associated with good decision making. Banks issue more capital both in good times and bad times. They make more, more loans in, in bad times. Okay. Whether or not this is, it suggests that it's actually the timeliness that gives rise to the decision making though is in doubt because there's a lot of other reasons that could drive the results. For example, it may just be that well-managed banks have both timely loan loss reserving and make good decisions and it's not the mechanism, timely loss reserving isn't the mechanism, it's just associated with, with the mechanism. Um, and so you can think it's quality of bank management or the quality of the bank's information systems or the credit risk modeling systems or market discipline is higher for some banks or other, than other banks or bank regulation intensity is higher for some banks than other banks. It doesn't have to be causal. Um, my, my main reason to think though that it's the loan loss reserving effect is not primarily driver is um, accounting standard setters are only going to allow a relatively narrow range of uh, approaches to loan loss reserving as acceptable. So the incurred loss model they can think of as acceptable. They're going to move to an expected credit loss uh, model that's going to be acceptable. The changes in loss reserves that will come from moving from one acceptable model to another acceptable model are not that large in terms of affecting capital ratios or in terms of uh, the amount compared to the ex post realization of credit losses when times go bad. Okay. Now you could come up with other unacceptable accounting approaches like what's called dynamic loss reserving, which is you use through the cycle loss rates to uh, estimate credit losses. So if you're in bad time, you assume times are going to get better, in good times, times are going to get worse. No accounting standard setter is going to go for that because it's completely unrooted to the present. Okay. Okay. These allegations, in any case, caused both the ISB already and the FASB uh, to be effective in 2020 to move to an expected credit loss model. Okay, what they've gotten rid of probable, reasonable and supportable forecasts. This will definitely increase uh, loan loss allowances in good times. And so you might think this is gonna be counter-cyclical because 
that means that they have to reserve less in bad times. My personal belief is this is going to be pro-cyclical. And the reason why is the way the, the expected loss reserving model works is you write a loan for 100, you have 5% expected losses, immediately you write down the loan to 95, and you take the, the, the five loss, you reduce equity, you reduce regulatory capital, you reduce income. You're sitting in bad times, you're a bank, your capital is in doubt. Do you write a loan and take the $5 hit to income up front? I think it is unlikely. So there's strong incentives if you um, front load uh, losses that you will reduce the incentive to lend in bad time, which is going to be pro-cyclical, not counter-cyclical. Okay. Okay, so that's the uh, first one. Second one is fair value accounting. The allegation was made during the crisis, which is absolutely true, which is illiquidity is market breakdown. And so if you require firms to write down assets to fair values, which are reduced by market illiquidity, then what you're going to do is overstate the loss to a firm that's capable of holding the position either to the recovery of liquidity or to the maturity of the instrument, whichever comes first. Okay, that's absolutely true. Um, okay, sorry, <laughs> missed my notes, okay. Um, in fact, many, there were actually some people, like Stephen Schwartzman, who claimed that the fair value accounting was the primary cause of the financial crisis. Um, while I think there's truth to the illiquidity story, this is clearly an overstatement. And the primary reason is that banks do not hold very many assets at fair value. Loans are not at fair value. Uh, held to maturity securities are not at fair value. Available for sale securities are at fair value on the balance sheet, but for all banks back during the financial crisis and most banks now, gains and losses on those assets don't affect capital. So what you're left with is derivatives, which only big banks hold, and trading positions, which only big banks hold. Those are the only positions that are fair valued, and their effects on even the big banks' balance sheets are quite small. So by definition, if they're the bank, the, the crisis is a banking-related uh, driven crisis. It, it can't be fair value accounting. Um, and in fact, the account, uh, uh, accounting standard setters haven't really messed too much with fair value accounting. The main change they made is, is to other than temporary impairment accounting, where they didn't require firms to write down impaired securities all the way to fair value and record the loss in income and capital. Instead, it's only to the present value of the cash flows. And so they ignored the illiquidity effect. Um, this also doesn't have much of an effect on banks, because banks don't hold too many securities. They may be 15% of their balance sheet. Most of the securities they hold are low credit risk, not high credit risk. Illiquidity is not a problem. In fact, during a crisis, low credit risk securities actually benefit from flights to quality. And there's a paper by uh, Bitch and Shea uh, that shows that, in fact, uh, gains and losses on available for sale securities are, in fact, countercyclical, not procyclical. Okay. And then the third area is securitizations. Um, it is true that up until 2010, the accounting rules, and there's two important ones. One governs sale versus secured borrowing for uh, securitizations. The other governs consolidation of securitization entity. Together, they basically gave rise to off-balance sheet accounting for virtually all securitizations. The only exception of note was certain multi-seller asset-backed commercial paper conduits. And for regulatory purposes, even those conduits were off-balance sheet. So basically, we had accounting and regulation based on the accounting that ignored leverage associated with securitizations altogether. And so the FASB wrote uh, some new standards. Um, oh, and so the, the allegation was that because of this, banks didn't pay enough attention to their lending. They, they lent too much. They lent too risky. Um, they got too levered, things like that. Okay. I think it's absolutely true that the old accounting for securitizations made no sense. The biggest problem was that um, banks would retain the tail risks uh, of securitized assets through liquidity support or credit support or something like that. M most of the time, <laughs> these tail risks don't materialize, and it looks like the banks have sort of given away all the risk. But in crises, these, uh, these risks materialize, and the banks bear all of the risk of the underlying assets. Okay, so the... Um, um, so the, I mean, uh, th there's research that suggests that, that some of these allegations are true, um, but uh, 
to a close approximation, the only banks that securitization are, that securitize are very big banks. So if this is a problem, it's a problem that's related completely to big banks. Um, even for, for big banks, even in uh, relatively bad times like 2010 when these standards became op uh, effective, uh, consolidation of entities affected their capital by anywhere from half a percent to two percent. So it took banks that were very well capitalized and made them uh, still well capitalized but a, bit, a little bit less so. Okay? So this is a pretty major change in accounting. It's actually the biggest change I think the, the FASB's made, and yet even this has relatively small effects on banks' capital. Okay. My personal, oh, I think I haven't been there, sorry. I'm very bad at this. Um, my personal belief is that if you, if you think that the problem is banks lend too risky, accounting is not the right way to convey that information. The right way to convey that information is by dis disclosure at the loan level of the types of loans that banks make. Uh, and in fact, we have a disclosure requirement starting in 2016 for securitization entities where they must disclose at the loan level the underlying loans, FICO scores, loan to value ratios, documentation, and so forth. And so now market participants can see if there's risk layering going on or risk bar bellowing or something else that's problematic in the underlying assets. Okay. Uh, how are we doing? I think I've got two or three minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, the FASB did change uh, securitization accounting. Um, it's not that everything's consolidated now. It's not that everything's on balance sheet. In fact, there's two main types of securitized assets that are on balance sheet. That's credit card receivables and asset-backed commercial paper. Uh, pretty much all other types of, of securitization entities remain off balance sheet. That includes subprime mortgage entities, residential mortgage entities, commercial-backed security mortgage entities, and so forth. Okay. Okay, so um, there are three channels for um, uh, accounting to affect stability. The, ch the channel that most research has thought about is the, the regulatory capital channel. Um, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's true that this channel is sort of usually in play for most accounting issues. Uh, but in my opinion, it's actually not typically the main channel for reasons I've mentioned, which is that accounting doesn't have that big effects on regulatory capital. Um, a good setting where regulatory capital is the mechanism, though, is that uh, the U.S. implementation of Basel III removed the AOCI filter for advanced approaches banks, which are the biggest banks. So these banks now, when they have unrealized gains and losses unavailable for sale securities, those gains and losses now hit capital. That makes their capital more volatile. Um, the AOCI filter has no effect on internal discipline or external discipline because it doesn't ch change the information available either inside banks or outside banks. All of the information is the same as before. Um, and so just to give you a sense for how complicated the, yeah, I'll end with a slide, for how complicated the effects of even this very simple change in accounting uh, requirements is. Uh, the, the, the removal of the AOCI filter had two direct effects. The first is the advanced approaches banks had incentives not to classify securities as available for sale and have gains and losses hit capital, instead to classify securities as held to maturity, which gets cost-based accounting and no regulatory capital effect. So that's a direct effect. Um, the problem with held to maturity security classification is you can't sell held to maturity securities without tainting the whole portfolio. So even though the securities may be liquid, you've effectively made the securities illiquid uh, if you don't want to taint your held to maturity securities portfolio. So if you want to raise financing off of the held to maturity securities, you can't sell them. Your only option is to, to pledge them in repurchase agreements accounted for as secured borrowings. And so what you find is that the big banks, they classified securities as held to maturity, and they increased their repurchase agreements as a substitute for selling securities when they needed liquidity. Second indirect effect is Repurchase agreements aren't as good as uh, sales of securities to provide liquidity because they uh, are shorter term. You have to keep rolling them over. Um, only good works for good collateral. And so their ability to raise financing goes down. Because the financing goes down, advanced approaches banks lend less. That's the second indirect effect. The second direct effect is that banks have the incentive to decrease the risk of their securities. They can either classify securities as available for sale securities, in which case volatility hits regulatory capital. They don't want that 
and so they reduce the risk of their available for sale securities, or they classify their securities as held to maturity, don't get volatility of regulatory capital, but now you've got securities that you can't manage the risks of as well, and so you want to reduce the risks of the uh, held to maturity securities as well. Once you've decreased your securities risk, that's reduced your interest rate spread. You reduce your interest rate spread, you try to get it back up. How do you do that? You increase the risk of your loans. Very simple uh, accounting treatment, a whole cascade of effects. If you want to think, is the AOCI filter removal good, bad, or indifferent, you have to think through the whole cascade of effects. Okay, I had two more slides, but uh, I'll end here. Like accounting standards, they are complicated. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, the next uh, speaker, last but not least, is Kim Schonholz from NYU as well. Can't see if it's up. Is, it, is the uh, thing up? OK, great. Um, I also can't see. There we go. OK. Uh, first. Like everyone else, let me thank the organizers for including me in this distinguished group. Uh, I'm going to discuss a few of the strengths and weaknesses of the Dodd-Frank Act, along with recent efforts to scale back the regulatory burden. Uh, the discussion is based on joint work with my Stern colleagues, Matt Richardson and Larry White, as well as with Brandeis Professor Steve Giacchetti. I also have benefited greatly from the series of Stern faculty books regarding post-crisis financial regulation. After eight years of Dodd-Frank and following the change of majority in the US government, it is natural for us to ask what works, what doesn't, and what's missing. Let me begin with five conclusions. First, Dodd-Frank has made the US financial system more resilient, but also increased the regulatory burden. Second, as Matt, Larry, and I emphasize in the annual review paper, there exists a key policy trade-off, namely higher levels of capital can substitute efficiently for other regulatory interventions. Put differently, there are diminishing returns to regulation once a large intermediary is adequately self-insured. Third, the US government recently has sought to ease compliance costs for small banks <laughs> but it also has scaled back oversight of larger intermediaries that can pose threats to the financial system. Fourth, some aspects of Dodd-Frank, especially the Volcker rule, are not cost effective. Finally, there remains considerable scope to reduce threats to the financial system. So which aspects of Dodd-Frank have made the financial system safer? First, together with new international standards, the act motivated large increases at, in capital at systemically important financial intermediaries, or CFIs. Second, to monitor capital adequacy, it introduced a credible stress testing regime that has become the de facto capital planning framework for CFI banks. Third, it created a CFI resolution regime that, while untested, makes it somewhat more likely that policymakers would refuse to bail out a large intermediary in a crisis. Finally, it supported tougher limits on liquidity and maturity transformation. At the same time, Dodd-Frank also raised compliance costs, not least by restricting the scope of activities in ways that are not closely linked with risk. In response, there has been a consensus to scale back the regulatory burden on small institutions, but there is disagreement about what to do with larger intermediaries. To what extent has Dodd-Frank made the US financial system more resilient? Without a model that embeds the counterfactual, it is difficult to, difficult to say. However, useful indicators of risk have declined notably since the law was enacted. Consider, for example, our preferred measure of system-wide capital adequacy the Stern V Labs S risk. US aggregate S risk has plunged by more than 80% from its peak in 2008. More specifically, since the enactment of Dodd Frank in July 2010, US S risk has dropped by nearly one half. 
In contrast, European S-risk has declined by less than one-fourth, while Asian S-risk has soared by a factor of more than three. Excluding China, Asian S-risk is up by about two-thirds. Sorry about that. There it is. My apologies. In our view, higher capital requirements on CFIs have been a particularly cost-effective tool helping to lower S-risk. As the Choice Act assumed, an intermediary with more equity capital poses less risk to the financial system. And by revealing the adequacy of capital in the bad state of the world, a credible stress test is a key complement to higher capital requirements. However, in contrast with our observation favoring self-insurance for CFI, CFIs over other forms of regulatory intervention, the recent government effort to scale back regulatory burdens has not excluded capital requirements and stress tests. Earlier this year, for example, Congress enacted a new law, the Economic Growth, Regulatory Reform, and Consumer Protection Act, that's a mouthful, that relaxes scrutiny of larger banks in the name of easing the burden of small banks. The act's most widely known feature raises the asset threshold for bank CFI status from $50 billion to $250 billion, thereby shrinking the number of CFIs by about two-thirds to 14. It places the burden on the Fed to show that banks in this medium range, 100 to $250 billion of assets, still merit closer scrutiny. It also eases the leverage requirements on some larger banks and allows a reduced frequency of stress tests. The new law implies that far too many institutions initially were included in the CFI class. However, there's good reason to be skeptical about relying on balance sheet size as the sole benchmark for closer regulatory scrutiny. To be sure, as the chart here shows, the largest six banks all fall far north of the $250 billion marker, the blue line uh, shown uh, in the chart on the, uh, the vertical blue line. These scores the, on the vertical axis are based on 11 indicators used by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision to assess banks' interconnectedness, their substitutability, their complexity, and their cross-jurisdictional activity. However, once you get below the scale of the six behemoths, size is overrated as an indicator of risk. To make this clear, I've excluded all banks with assets greater than $500 billion. Otherwise, the chart is the same. Now we see that several banks in the range of 100 to $250 billion have substantially higher risk scores. Those are the ones marked in red on the, in the bottom left uh, quadrant uh, than those in the $250 to $500 billion class, the ones marked in blue. Going forward, increased regulatory arbitrage at the $250 billion cutoff may amplify these differences. In addition to legal changes, discretionary regulatory changes have scaled back the oversight of CFIs, especially at non-banks. As of 2014, the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC, had designated four non-banks as CFIs, AIG, GE Capital, MetLife, and Prudential. Credible designation authority creates incentives for those firms wishing to avoid higher capital requirements and greater scrutiny to adjust their business models accordingly. Indeed, following evidence that they had de-risked their businesses, FSOC rescinded the designations of GE Capital in 2016 and 2017. One year ago, Treasury argued in a report that FSOC should prioritize industry-wide activities regulation over entity regulation. This makes considerable sense, especially for the asset management industry where, with a few exceptions like money market mutual funds, the investors rather than the managers assume market risk. However, we have seen no subsequent wave of activities regulation. Moreover, for entities that are able to conceal risk, it is doubtful that activities regulation alone would be sufficient to ensure financial resilience. Yet today, there are no non-bank CFIs. FSOC rescinded the designation of Prudential last month, while earlier this year, Treasury withdrew its appeal 
of a 2016 court decision that overturned the designation of MetLife. Were these reversals warranted? FSOC's October rescission notice states that the firm's aggregate capital markets exposures were largely unchanged since its 2013 designation. And they added that its complexity still made it a challenge to resolve. Otherwise, the heavily redacted rescission document does not allow us to independently assess whether Prudential's business has become safer. So let's turn to a market-based measure of leverage, namely the ratio of market value of equity to the sum of debt and the market value of equity. For Prudential, depicted in red, there is no evidence of a material change over the past eight years. Prudential's market leverage ratio also is lower than that of both MetLife and AIG. Note, this is not a gearing ratio, it's the regulatory leverage ratio, equity to the sum of equity and debt. It's also far below the ratio that prevailed in late 2007, ahead of the worst year of the crisis. Keep in mind that the largest life insurers today are far more like other intermediaries than their traditional business model implies. As Acharya and Richardson have argued, the industry now offers products with non-diversifiable risk that are more prone, it is more prone to a run. It insures against macro-wide events and has expanded its role in financial markets. The bottom line, in my view, by eliminating non-bank CFIs and by raising the threshold for future designation, Treasury and the FSOC are encouraging intermediaries to take on large intermediaries, to take on additional risk that could very well increase the likelihood of a crisis. Let me now turn to an opportunity to lower compliance costs without diminishing resilience. I'm talking about the Volcker Rule. The aim of the rule is simple, to prevent banks from funding speculative activities using liabilities subsidized by the government, for example, through deposit insurance. Yet the Volcker rule as implemented today is not Paul Volcker's rule. Over the five years of its gestation, the rule as promulgated by federal regulators became long and complex. It's also overseen by five different federal regulators. Earlier this year, the Fed requested comments on a proposal to simplify it. One key problem with the rule is that it does not directly address risk. An example makes it clear. While a bank can make and trade corporate loans, it cannot buy and trade corporate bonds for its own account, nor can it invest beyond a small amount in a private equity fund that makes corporate loans. The underlying risks of these instruments may be the same, but the rule's treatment sharply differs. A second problem is that there is no simple way to distinguish market making from proprietary trading. The rule establishes a complex set of exemptions that require costly trade-by-trade -trade oversight to ensure compliance. The point is we can do better. Higher capital requirements on CFIs combined with an easing or even an elimination of the Volcker Rule likely would lower compliance costs while making the banking system safer. This is a classic example of the regulatory trade-off that the annual review paper highlights. That brings me to my final point. Both recent legislation, whoops, did that go off? Well, sorry about that. That brings me to my final point. Both recent legislation Oops, maybe I can squeeze it down now. Both recent legislation and discretionary actions overlook important opportunities to make the financial system safer and more efficient. At the top of the list would be a streamlining of the U.S. regulatory framework. Today's Rube Goldberg-like structure makes it nearly impossible for anyone to view the financial system as a whole or to detect its vulnerabilities. The U.S. approach not only weakens oversight and crisis management, but it also can raise entry barriers, for example, for fintech startups. Second, there is plenty of scope for increased transparency as a means to promote market discipline. One example, simple example, would be to report regularly the extent of the resources that central clearing parties can call on from their clearing members in a crisis. Today's CCPs
are so enormous and so central to the global financial network that their distress can be transmitted instantly around the world. Third, in my view, there remains considerable scope to hike capital requirements on CFIs gradually further. At the same time, we should watch out for unintended side effects, such as diminished credit supply or a shifting of risk beyond the regulatory perimeter. Finally, threats to the financial system from cyber risk and other forms of operational risk have grown massively. One reason, ironically, is the success of Dodd-Frank in shifting the trading of derivatives from over-the-counter to central clearing. Having put all of our eggs in a few CCP baskets, we need to ensure that those baskets are safe or make arrangements for their instant repair. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kim. Um, Please join me in thanking all uh, five speakers, and I...